Motherhood plays an important role in the Bible. It binds the beginning and the end. These stories offer us a glimpse into the heart of God. And so we start at the beginning. Taken from the side of Adam, gifted with bringing forth life, the first woman was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. But she was also a mother in her own right, the first of many mothers to come. Though Sarah's womb was closed, God promised nations and kings would come from her. Ten years pass and motherhood seems as impossible as the day it was promised. But the Lord is faithful to keep his promises and Sarah bore a son who made her laugh. Leah was the firstborn, overlooked by her husband Jacob, who gave his heart to her younger sister. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Despite Jacob's disdain, she found her motherhood in the Lord. When Pharaoh became angry at the fruitfulness of the Hebrews, Jochebed sacrificed her motherhood for the sake of her son. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she had compassion on him. Because of Jochebed's sacrificial motherhood, the Israelites found freedom. Naomi was a mother who experienced the loss of her sons, yet she gained a daughter in Ruth who declared, For where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth became family by faith. Mary, a virgin and not yet married, was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The motherhood of this blessed woman was more than the continuation of a family name, but a means for God to bring a savior into the world to save his people from their sins. From the garden to the cross, there have always been mothers. These women paved the way for all women, representing the full spectrum of the ways one could be called mom. Whether a mother in faith, mentorship, adoption, or by birth, you play an important role in the stories of generations to come. To all the Sarahs, Leahs, Jochebeds, and Naomis, Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day indeed. Well, good morning everyone and welcome to our online gathering this Sunday morning. And of course, a particularly big welcome and thank you to all of our mums and our grandmas, our great grandmas, our aunts and our sisters today, as well as our mum-like figures, as we give thanks to God for you. And we do truly thank God for you. We give thanks to God for your faithfulness, for your sacrifice, for your love, and most of all, for the ways that you point us to Jesus. We hope and pray that you all have a wonderful day today, ladies, both celebrating and being celebrated. Now, friends, one of the key things that we do is we gather together each week, even online in an environment like this, is to reorientate our hearts and our minds as God's people. A time for us to identify and then cast aside some of the false narratives that we've been exposed to during the course of the week as we centre our minds again on Jesus where we remind ourselves that security is not found in our supplies of pasta and rice and toilet paper. Sorry, I still can't get over that. That our security is not found in our superannuation accounts, in our homes or our investment portfolios, even in our family or our health. But that security is found in Christ alone. And friends, we're going to start our gathering this morning by centering our minds on the cross. 
the eternity shaping, life transforming cross. The cross where our sin is paid for, where death is defeated and where the new covenant is inaugurated. And let's do that now. And friends, as we sing this beautiful hymn to begin our time together, when I survey the wondrous wondrous cross, can I encourage you to use this time as you sing with all of your heart, to use it as a way of reorientating yourself this Lord's Day. Let's now sing together. Good morning MVC family and kids and a very special good morning to all the lovely and special ladies in our lives. Happy Mother's Day. We're very excited that you're joining us this morning. I was really excited on Wednesday we had a kids Zoom meeting and that was really exciting to see lots of lovely MB kids faces to catch up to see how you guys are going um, and we're really looking forward to doing that again in the future but more so getting to see your lovely faces in person. One thing that you know we've been doing is getting you guys to send in all your wonderful creations that you've been making. We still have stacks of space on the wall, but two that have come in this week 
I have in person. Uh, this is another Lego inspired thing. It is the Bible written out in Lego, which is really exciting. And then I've actually had one dropped off to the church, which is Jesus asleep in the boat while the storm is raging around him. So keep those coming guys. I love seeing all of those. Now, Yakas, you're not meeting this week. This week is a chance for you to maybe spend some time pampering your mums instead, but you'll be back on next week. So be sure to look out for that invite. This morning, you guys will be looking at God's mercy. So when it's time for the sermon to happen, you can go away and do your activity sheets on God's mercy. But before then, we have two things. First, we're going to sing a great song by some people that we know well called Thank You, God. And after that, tune in because there'll be a little special treat for mums. See you next week, guys. Bye. This song, Thank You God, has lots of actions. Now, I'm going to try and do them all and try and remember them all. Um, but if I don't, you can always do it and you can laugh at me when I get them wrong. All right, let's sing Thank You God. his gifts with love. He's the perfect father who gave his perfect son. He's the God who loves to show his love for everyone. So we say thank you God for the animals and trees, for the rivers and the oceans and the summer breeze. And thank you God for families, for parties and picnics afternoon tea and thank you God for lollies and for giving me a good toothbrush and thank you for Jesus the Savior and the King who by your grace you're given to us thank you God for teachers and schools for texters and pencils and pens for a mouth to talk and feet to walk good games and great friends and thank you God for dancing for soccer and basketball for chocolate for houses computers and toys but for Jesus most of all so we say thank you God for the animals and trees for the rivers and the oceans and the summer breeze and thank you God for because they play with us. I love I love mummies because they cuddle. I like I like mum since they're always there where we need us. I love mums because they are always there if we need them. Maya loves mums because they're very nice and they're very cuddly. I love mums because they're so awesome. I agree, Mim. Mums are awesome. Well done, kids. That was absolutely fantastic. It was so good to see your smiling faces on our screens this Sunday morning. 
Well, friends, on Tuesday, if you are a regular here at NBC and we have your email address, you would have received a link to a short survey where the staff team are seeking your feedback on how you've been finding our online services over these last few months. And on behalf of the staff team, I just wanted to say a big thank you for your response. I think we received about 100 responses in the first 36 hours alone. And we really appreciate the feedback you, that you've provided. There's still a couple of days to provide that feedback. So if you haven't quite yet had a chance to do that, can I encourage you in the next day or two, it should only take a few minutes jump online and complete that survey. We'd love to hear your feedback as to how you're finding our services at this time. And friends, just on behalf of the staff team, can I thank you so much for your love and encouragement and support over this season. We have truly felt so loved and overwhelmed by your encouragement at this time. Like all of you, we're learning as we go along, making lots of mistakes along the way. But we're so thankful that God is using these services to encourage you and uplift you at this quite unusual time. Each week, I'm sure you've noticed in both our morning and our evening services, we're adding a few extra elements as we go along and we plan to continue doing that. And God willing, if government restrictions continue to lessen, um, will continue to be adding new things into the services. Now, if you've been coming along to our evening service, you would have noticed that over the last few weeks, we've had interviews with members of our church family, hearing about the way that God is using them and the way that he's particularly teaching them in this season. And we'd love to also have some members of our morning congregation participate in that. So if you'd, be, if you'd like to, to share your testimony of how you came to know Jesus, maybe share how God has been shaping you into the likeness of Jesus during this time, please get in touch with us during the course of the next few weeks. We'd love to hear from you and we can arrange a time to record. Now friends, on this Mother's Day, and in fact every day, one of the best things that we can do for our mums is pray for them. And we're going to do that now with one of our mums here at NBC Ruth as she leads us as we pray together. Good morning everyone and happy Mother's Day too. My name is Ruth and I have the privilege of leading us now in the time of prayer and Bible study. Please join with me as I start with Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Heavenly Father, we behold the wondrous mysteries of your great love for us. We praise you as our creator and sustainer our only hope and refuge in life and death. We thank you for the gift of your Son who made himself nothing, who took on human flesh, who humbled himself through obedience to death on the cross, and who was raised to life again for our justification. We praise you that in your great mercy you have given us new life into a living hope with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Father, though we are imperfect and sinful, we can come before you because of the righteousness of Jesus. We thank you for this hope we have in your Son, our risen Saviour, who even now is ruling and reigning over all. We praise you that the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in your people, and we thank you for the knowledge that he intercedes for us, guides us, and reveals you to us, and teaches us from your word to grow up. Please forgive our unrepentant hearts for how we wander away from you and stop being amazed and in awe at the holiness of our great God. May we, your people, draw ever closer to you, confessing our sins and striving to be more like Jesus in every way. Thank you again for your promise to us that if we confess our sins in true repentance, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. 
Thank you that your word also reaches out to our brothers and sisters who are suffering persecution because they belong to you. Thank you for their testimony of faith which encourages us. And may it also grow us and empower us through your spirit to serve you faithfully and to give so that the gospel can reach out to many who need to hear about Jesus' death and resurrection. Father, our world groans under the weight of issues this pandemic brings. We pray for those suffering with health concerns, those with difficult financial needs, for our medical professionals, our essential service people, and for wisdom, especially for our government leaders, as they respond to the challenges around us. May this give us opportunity for people to turn to you for guidance and decision making. We pray for a mighty outpouring of your spirit upon us all. May compassion rule our hearts and open our lives to respond as your spirit leads us. As a local body of believers, may we show mercy and generosity in both word and deed. Use us, your people, to share Jesus lovingly and willingly. We ask for continuing wisdom and the sustaining of our church leaders to remain strong in this exacting time. Thank you for all who have gone out from us to minister around this world. Keep us all united together with one goal, and that is to see your name honoured and glorified. For our church family, we remember those unwell, and especially those struggling with the health issues old age brings, those who are grieving, and those with mental and physical challenges to rest in you, drawing strength from your presence with them. Although we are physically separated one from another, may we continue to be bound together by your spirit. Thank you for the opportunity today to remember mothers. Please give them all the patience to deal with the difficulties this world brings, but also the joy of seeing the gift of lives given into their care by you. May we be a source of love and encouragement to them everywhere. As your word is opened up to us, we pray that it may spare us on in our walk with you, and that your Holy Spirit will speak the things that you have us learn today and apply to our hearts. May we live in expectant hope of your return, when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are our Lord and Redeemer our mighty God, and our glorious Saviour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come now to a time of reading of God's Word. We're reading from Jeremiah chapter 30. We start at verse 1. That is Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1. Topic is restoration of Israel. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard, terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor, every face turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. 
So do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. So I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you. I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable. Your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause, no remedy for your sore, no healing for you. All your allies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I have struck you as an enemy would and punished you as would the cruel, because your guilt is so great and your sins so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? Because of your great guilt and many sins, I have done these things to you. But all who devour you will be devoured. All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered. All who make spoil of you, I will despoil. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Because you are called an outcast. Zion, for whom no one cares. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tent and have compassion on his dwelling. The city will be rebuilt on his ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honour, and they will not be disdained. Their children will be as in days of old, and their community will be established before me. I will punish all who oppress them. Their leader will be one of their own. Their ruler will arise from among them. I will bring him near, and he will come close to me. For who is he who will devote himself to be close to me, declares the Lord. So you will be my people, and I will be your God. See the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a driving wind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand this. This is God's word. Well, thanks, Ruth, and good morning, everyone. Let me add my word of welcome. It's great to be with you all this morning. For any who don't know me, my name's Ryan, and with Andrew, I'm one of the pastors here at Narrow Baptist. And let me say as well a special Happy Mother's Day to all those mother figures in our lives. It's such a blessing to know and to be loved by you. If you've been with us for any length of time here in our morning service, you'll know by now that we've been studying the book of Jeremiah, at least for the last good while. And you would know by now that the book of Jeremiah is primarily a book of judgment. It is a time where God, through his prophet, declared his judgment against his own people, Judah, and indeed Israel. He pointed them to the impending exile that was going to come upon them. They're being driven out of their homeland, that promised land, and into the Babylonian nation. And even last week, we were reminded that this reality was looming large for these people and that when it came to pass, it wouldn't be a brief exile. Andrew helpfully reminded us last week that the people would have to make a new life in Babylon. They would settle there, make families and homes and lives for themselves, that they would be there for many years. 
But they were also told that this exile wouldn't be a pleasant experience, that it was, in fact, God's judgment and punishment upon them. Indeed, most of the book of Jeremiah thus far has been spent either in anticipation of judgment or warning of God's judgment. And much of what follows toward the end of the book is the actual experience of that judgment being enacted as the people are indeed captured and exiled into Babylon. Jeremiah, therefore, is often called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah is a man who laments constantly over the state of his people and over the punishment that is coming upon them. Jeremiah oversaw the sin and unrepented hearts of Judah. No matter how often he called them to repentance, he never saw such fruit. And ultimately, Jeremiah would go on to see the downfall, the downfall of Judah, the downfall of her people, and the downfall and ruin of Jerusalem. But at the moment in the book here in chapter 30, Jeremiah sits between these two. He has already made the proclamations of judgment that are coming, but it has not yet come to pass. And in this interlude, for a brief moment here at the heart of the book of Jeremiah, he spends some four chapters from chapter 30 through 33 in what's often described as the book of comfort. Here in the heart of a book of judgment, a heart of a book of anguish, we find these few chapters that focus on hope and redemption, a hope of a future and a hope of restoration for the people of God. It is the hope that their judgment will not be forever, a hope that their hardship will eventually, by God's grace, give way to peace. And it begins here in Jeremiah 30 from verse 1, where we read, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is the Lord, sorry, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. See here at the beginning of this interlude, this book of hope, God instructs Jeremiah, write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. Jeremiah is instructed not merely to speak these words as has so often happened before, but rather to compose a book, to write a scroll or compile a volume. He's told to record all the words that God has spoken to him, and most likely that means the entire book of Jeremiah, not just these words here and now. All that has gone before and all the new words God shall give Jeremiah are to be written down. Why? Why should these words be recorded in a book rather than a letter or simply spoken in another sermon? Well, Jeremiah, I believe, must write these words down because they are to remain for the generations to come. These words will be recorded for those who are ultimately going to see them accomplished. Those who will, by these words, have their faith encouraged that God's prophecy is confirmed and fulfilled. These words will be carefully preserved, bound, and stored in archives or among the public registers, wherever they may be. They'll be conserved for all posterity, for when they come to pass, there shall be none alive who remember them when they were spoken. These words are to be recorded as a guide and a hope for future generations. In Jeremiah 30 from verse three, he says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess. And so these words must be recorded so that when that day approaches, the people will have eyes to see it, hearts to believe it and minds that understand it. We see this come to pass in our scriptures. In the book of Daniel, 
from chapter 9, verse 2, we read, sorry, from chapter 9, verse 1, we read, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the, de the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. You see, back here in Jeremiah's time, God has him record these words that will ultimately be fulfilled in Daniel's time. That Daniel would be able to see the hope that God had promised, a day of restoration that would come, that it would lead men like Daniel to repentance, to seek forgiveness for their sin, to seek once more after the God who had driven them into a foreign land. But getting to that point would be painful back in Jeremiah 30, from verse 4 through 7, we read, These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see. Can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? every face turned deathly pale how awful that day will be no other will be like it it will be a time of trouble for jacob but he will be saved out of it yes friends there would be pain before there would be peace and god here paints such a vivid image of the torment that judah will endure terror not peace he says there will be fighting on the outskirts of jerusalem fear within her walls this will not be a pleasant time and god offers this image that of a man so stricken with fear and anguish that they clutch themselves like a woman in labor distressed and pained at how awful these events truly are and yet it's interesting that God here chooses the image of labor pains, not the pangs of death. For like labor, this will all give way to new life, to new hope. It will not end in such distress and fear. Verse 7, part B says, It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. Though this judgment, this suffering will be great and intense, it will be passing. They will be saved, saved out of such anguish, not spared from it, but brought through it in God's good timing. And so he continues in verse 8. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. God paints this image of pain giving way to new life, where burdens will be lifted, where fears will be eased where bonds will be broken and where slaves will once more be set free. This is the hope that Jeremiah begins to present in this section of his book, that this restoration is coming. And in verse 9 he says, Instead they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. This is the ultimate promise God could make in these circumstances. That having endured their just punishment, having endured the exile that God has brought about, they will be restored once more to their right purpose. They will be once more serving Yahweh, their God, the one true God, in his place. 
and likewise they will be led by one who sits on the throne of David, a descendant of God's chosen king. This is the perfect picture of Israel as it should have been under the promises God made to David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promised that his kingdom would endure, that under God David's throne would be established and would last forever, that God would keep his people in his land, that God would establish them for his own good purposes, that the house of the Lord and the house of David would stand together. And in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, he concludes this promise, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so it is that as Jeremiah makes this promise, promised from the lips of God himself, he envisages a time where order will be restored, where right worship of God and right service of God's chosen king will be re-established, where things will, for want of a better term, be as they should be. This should bring these people such great encouragement as Jeremiah continues in verse 10. So do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. I am with you, and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. See that what God does here in exiling his people driving them from the promised land and into Babylon, is intended to be for their own good. It is a way of correcting them, a way of rebuking and disciplining them, we see there in verse 11. That God will not let their waywardness go unpunished is certain. But here he says that his ultimate goal is to correct, discipline, and then restore them. See here, friends, that God's correction, God's discipline, always proceeds from his love. His ultimate purpose is his glory and their well-being. And so the correction is based on what God would do, not what his people would do. Notice here in those verses just read that it is always God who is the active part in the story. It is he who disciplines, he who judges, he who casts out. It is he who will remove them, scatter them. So too it is he who will spare them, he who will restore them, he who will gather them back in. Confidence in the mercy and sovereignty of God is to be on display here. Not that people can somehow control their own circumstances themselves, but that God is ultimately in control. And may I say that for these Israelites, for these people of Judah, this should be a point of great praise. Thank goodness their restoration depends on the mercy and goodness of God. Thank goodness it is based on his glory and his holiness and not on their own actions. For if their salvation was based on their capacity to act, we know this would not play out as God has said. We have already seen how incapable these people are of following God's laws and instructions. How incapable they are of living in accordance with God's holy plans and purposes. No, this salvation will be based solely on God and his own actions and they are promptly reminded from verse 12 that this is the case this is what the Lord says your wound is incurable 
your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause, no remedy for your sore, no healing for you. All your allies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I have struck you as an enemy would and punished you as would the cruel because your guilt is so great, your sins so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? Because of your great guilt and many sins, I have done these things to you. See that Israel's condition is not within their control. They are unable to bring themselves out of the circumstance in which they have been placed. Their wounds are too great. Their sin has been too great. Their guilt has increased to the point of breaking. And so they are unable to act, unable to even plead, unable to depend on allies or resources, either external or within. They are unable to heal and thoroughly unable to save themselves. Only if God chooses mercy will Israel have any hope. Well, praise be to the God of heaven and earth that he does indeed choose to be merciful. Read on with me from verse 16, where he declares, But all who devour you will be devoured. All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered, and all who make spoil of you I will despoil. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. See that it is God who will heal and restore. God who will destroy enemies, break bonds and lift burdens. It is God who will bring his people out of exile and back into his own promised land. But why? Well, he says it there in verse 17. I will restore you to health. I will heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. See here, brothers and sisters, God reminds these people. They are the people of Zion. Zion is the place on which Jerusalem stood. It is central to the people of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel. They are the people who bear the name of God. And for his name's sake, they will be restored. God will restore them because when others look at them in their exile, they will consider them outcasts, nothing. They will not glorify Yahweh. See here, friends, it is because of his holy name, his holy glory, that Israel will be restored. Israel was punished since they had besmirched the name of God. In their sin, they had not glorified the God of glory. They had not been holy and they had ignored his holy nature. They had tarnished his name in all the earth. But so too they would be restored because they are Israel. They are those who bear the name of God. They are the people of Zion, the mountain of God. They are Israel, a name bestowed on Jacob, which means God fights or God fights for. And so it is that in restoring Israel, God will fight for his name's sake and his own glory, that people would no longer look at them as outcasts and the downtrodden but as the holy people of God who worship him and serve his king. And so from verse 18, we read, This is what the Lord says. 
I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tent and have compassion on his dwellings. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving, the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honour, they will not be dishonoured. Their children will be as in the days of old and their community will be established before me. I will punish all who oppress them. Their leader will be one of my own, their ruler will arise from among them. I will bring him near and he will come close to me. For who is he who will devote himself to be close to me, declares the Lord. So you will be my people and I will be your God. What a glorious moment it would be when the punished exiles, when those scattered people are restored to their former glory. What a magnificent testimony this story will be to the goodness, the holiness, the glory of God. When all things are returned to how they should be, all people will have eyes to see that Yahweh is the sovereign, righteous God. They will give him glory. They will see his holiness. And now they will also see the great mercy of God the great mercy he displays to his people. Verse 23. See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a driving wind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand this. Friends, these things we have considered are the purposes of God's heart to correct and rebuke his people, to restore them that he might be glorified, that his mercy might be displayed. He does all these things for his own name's sake, as is proclaimed through the prophet Isaiah when he declared that the time had come to leave Babylon. If you have your Bibles, come across to Isaiah chapter 48 where from verse 9, God says, For my own name's sake I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise I hold it back from you, so as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. Just as Isaiah declared so clearly, Jeremiah understood that God's ultimate purpose in both the exile and the restoration were revealing his own character, his own glory. May we take comfort in this, that God is glorified in such things. And so today, as we come to the end of this passage, let me offer three lessons for us today. Three encouragements for our own hearts that we can glean from Jeremiah 30. Firstly, friends, see that there is mercy in the discipline. Our God is a holy God, we know, and he rightly and justly punishes sin. So too, he rightly and correctly corrects and disciplines his own people but he regularly displays his mercy to us even as he disciplines us even as he punishes people see back in eden the first sin enters the world as god is disobeyed by adam and eve but as he drives them from the garden he mercifully clothes them with the skin of animals covering their nakedness and shame. So to here with Israel's punishment, we see that ultimately they also will be healed, restored and given peace. They will experience the mercy of God in amidst their judgment. And we see it in our own lives too. 
in Hebrews chapter 12. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to come across there now. In Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 4, we read, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. See here the mercy of God intermingled with his discipline. By disciplining us, God proves to us that we are his children, heirs of his promises. His discipline, his correction in our lives equally reveals his love for us, his care for us. And so the author of Hebrews continu continues in 10, they discipline us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Brothers and sisters, as God disciplines us in our life, guiding us into and through hardship and struggle, know that he is ultimately revealing you to be a child of God. He is demonstrating his love for you in leading you into righteousness and into refinement. In the times of discipline and correction, don't miss the mercy, friends. Secondly, from Jeremiah 30, I would take that we see quite clearly that God controls the calamity. God controls all that befalls the people of Israel, so too all that befalls the people of the nations. God affects and allows all things to happen, all to bring about his good purpose. We see it here in Jeremiah that God uses the Babylonians, even though he will ultimately punish them for their own sinfulness. We see God use such means in allowing Job to suffer the torments of Satan, that he might be refined into a more godly character. We see God use all manner of calamity most clearly in allowing the death of Christ on the cross. It is in this moment that the seeming greatest evil the death of the Holy One is actually turned for good, for the greatest good. Jesus crucified and resurrected that people of faith might live again. This is good news. That God is in control is good news. You don't want to serve a God who is powerless or impotent, unable to control circumstances in your life or the life of those around you. Imagine serving a God who didn't have power to govern his own creation. No matter your circumstances, know that God is in control. And whilst the circumstances may not be comfortable, it should be comfortable or comforting to know that God is holding all things and working things together for his own purposes. Even as the men of Judah agonized like laboring women, it was under the hand of a sovereign God. And so it is in Romans 8 that we are reminded from verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies. Like those men of Judah, all creation groans for restoration, longs for the day where things will be set right before our holy God. And as we read on in Romans 8, 
it is no trite thing to remind ourselves, brothers and sisters, that the passage continues. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What great encouragement we see running throughout the pages of our scriptures, that God is always in control of all circumstance. So take heart in whatever circumstance you find yourselves in, God is in control. And if you are a person of faith in Christ, he is working those circumstances for your good and for his glory. Our final point from Jeremiah chapter 30 is that those who follow God still serve the Lord and David's kingship. In Jeremiah 30 verse 9, we were given that image of restoration, that perfect ideal situation for Israel, where we read, Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up. Back in Jeremiah 30 verse 9, as God promises the reinstatement of David, it is not the promise that somehow King David will be resurrected and placed back on the throne but rather that his line, his seed, would endure. See here in Jeremiah 30 verse 9, there is the glimpse of a Messiah who would come, one who would take on the reign of King David and rule the people of God. Well, we know that that one is our own Lord Jesus. In Luke's Gospel, in chapter 1 from verse 31, as the angel speaks to Mary, he says... You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. If you are listening to this message and you have not yet come to serve this God, and his King Jesus. Know that if you would be brought from a place of sin and guilt, restored to a place of hope and mercy, that that restoration must come about by God's own hand and in God's own way. And he declares it quite clearly, that his way is serving him and following his King. Not David of old, but the one who now sits on David's throne, the risen Lord Jesus. Friends, this section of Jeremiah's book, this insert in the midst of judgment and torment, this book of hope is not just for Judah and Israel, but hope for the true heirs of God's promises, true Israel, all those who would have faith in Christ. Friends, as you read these four chapters in the midst of this book, May they stir your hearts to hope in the goodness and mercy of God. May they stir your minds to trust in the sovereignty of his plans and purposes. May they lead you to Jesus. And may they make you glorify our holy God, just as they did for Israel in their day. Let's pray together that this would be the case. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we see through your entire scriptures continuity in the narrative. That we can see your grand plan and purpose unfolding before our eyes as we read from Old Testament through to New. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you offer people who are sinful, guilty and wayward. That there is a hope of restoration. That for the people of old it would be return and restoration out of exile, that for us, it is a hope found in Jesus. Lord, we pray that we would continue to be encouraged by the knowledge that you control all things, that you are working all things for our good and for your glory. Draw us into service of yourself. Draw us that we might follow our King Jesus. We pray that you would enable to do this all the days of our lives, that you might be glorified. Amen.
And brothers and sisters, in response to what we've considered now, we're going to join together in a time of praise. Let's join together in song. Friends, we started our time together recognizing that we gather to reorientate and recenter our hearts and our minds on God. And I trust that as we've prayed, as we've read, and as we've studied God's word this morning, that we've done just that. Can I encourage you now as we continue in worship and reflection in our homes or wherever you find yourself to spend some time thinking about those three key lessons for us this morning. That there is mercy in God's discipline. That God's discipline proves that we are his children. He does it for our good. Maybe you might want to give thanks to God for his discipline in your life and consider how he might be achieving his purposes through that. Maybe you might want to give thanks to God with those that you're with, that he is in control of the calamity. How different is that to the narrative that we're seeing on the radio or the TV or the internet at the moment? That God is holding this world together and achieving his purposes. And most importantly, that those who trust in God will continue to serve him. I wonder how is God prompting you at this time to continue serving him 
in this season. Can I encourage you now that rather than ducking off to have a cup of tea or coffee, spend some time maybe in prayer or quiet reflection, considering how God has reorientated your heart and your mind this morning. God bless you and we'll see you at five o'clock tonight where we'll be looking at Romans 7 and Romans 4 and asking the question, how is it that people in the Old Testament were saved given they lived and died before Jesus? We'll see you then.